OK, so yeah, thanks very much for uh, setting this up, uh, Catherine and uh, Annegret. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, concentration camps in uh, pre-war Nazi Germany um, and especially on uh, their role in uh, 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 nurturing some of the violence that will be unleashed on Europe in the Second World War, including, of course, uh, the Holocaust. I thought I'd start with a bit of, uh, of context uh, for uh, how the concentration camps emerged and why they're important in the pre-war period. Um, and the Nazis rather theatrically um, uh, described um, Hitler's... Oh, someone took, someone took control of my presentation then. Please don't. I hope that wasn't me. I was just altering the sound quality on my own PC, so I hope oh, that right. didn't affect you at all. It's quite my possibly my, 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 it my atrocious IT skills. Don't don't feel bad. I'll try it again. But yeah, please don't press the button that says take control. Okay. Take two. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I thought I'd start with just a bit of context <coughs> on the origins of the concentration camps in the early years and why, why you should care about them. Um, and so the Nazis quite theatrically described Hitler's appointment as Chancellor of the Weimar Republic on the 30th of January um, as the seizure of power, the Macht Ergreifung. Um, and their script was that on this day, uh, the Nazis had demanded the chancellorship in the righteous name of the renaissance German people, and Hindenburg had, had no choice but to uh, assent to this appointment. Uh, but in fact, this rather tawdry appointment of Hitler merely opened the door to what was really the seizure of power um, in the ensuing uh, months or uh, maybe a year. So governments had come and gone with great rapidity during the Weimar Republic. Um, and the, I say the real seizure of power is when the Nazis sweep aside their political competition with great state sponsored violence with the paramilitaries to the fore in the first uh, kind of five months of 1933. So during this opening wave of Nazi violence, um, around 200,000 Germans were abducted, uh, beaten up and then locked up in assorted uh, kind of camps and torture cellars and improvised prisons. So these were very much political prisoners. Um, and overwhelmingly, they were activists of the German uh, organized labor movement, which was at this stage uh, the biggest in the world outside of the Soviet Union. Um, and it's important for context to recall that in the last three elections of the Weimar Republic, the combined vote for the Communist Party and the Social, Social Democratic Party uh, was greater than that of the NSDAP. Um, and so for the Nazis, there's no talk, there's no prospect of a thousand year Reich um, without the destruction of the organized working class. Now this wave of violence has rather uh, vanished from, uh, from view in most historical scholarship. And this is partly because the body count uh, in uh, the first months of 1933 was in the hundreds. Uh, which seems, you know, kind of fairly uh, small fry compared to the millions who would be murdered in the Nazi regime's uh, wartime uh, racial rampage. Um, but it's important to stress, uh, I don't think I should need to, but uh, the supersession of the rule of law by arbitrary terror in 1933 not only paved the way for the horrors that would come uh, kind of nine years later, um, but it's also a topic of urgent and very contemporary um, relevance in its own right. I mean, murder, for example, remains illegal on the statute book of Nazi Germany. So all this happens in a state of, um, of, of illegality. And the pre-war concentration camps uh, are far less well known generally and far less studied than the wartime camps. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, they were at the centre of this enormous wave of foundational violence, which um, uh, you know kind of like brings about the Nazi dictatorship. Uh, so just a bit of kind of um, institutional context and full disclosure. Um, I was part of this University of London project on the Nazi concentration camps in the pre-war period. 
And what we collectively uncovered in our research was the countless ways that the camps intruded into German society. So in the press, in the economy, in conversations, in pubs and taxis, in playground games, in sights, in smells, in sounds, even in people's dreams. Um, and the Nazis were very accomplished, Goebbels in particular, at choreographing the popular acclaim that we all see on television documentaries, but they very much depend on an institutional web of terror and discipline in which imprisonment in a concentration camp was um, uh, the most uh, the most feared uh, the most feared sanction. Uh, <clears throat> so although the concentration camps that I'm going to talk about today uh, were not primarily instruments of anti-Semitic policy, though Jews were indeed imprisoned and treated particularly appallingly, and they didn't have gas chambers, they are still terrifying and lethal places to be imprisoned. So inmates worked for 10 hours a day under the oversight of guards who could beat and even shoot them at will. Um, and prisoners were often shot. And then the excuse was dreamed up for the, the judiciary that they'd been shot trying to uh, trying to escape. Now, releases from these camps, prisoner releases were frequent in the 1930s. Um, and in the first few years, most prisoners do uh, are released after a few months. Some unlucky prisoners are in for, for a full 12 years, but most are released after a few months. They are warned not to speak of their experiences in the camp, but many did. And in this way, they helped to spread the message of Nazi terror to their social circles, which is pretty much what the Nazis, Nazi regime wanted them to, uh, to do. Um, and no single group in German pre-war society was um, uh, immune from the concentration camps. So workers, bosses, lawyers, doctors, journalists, priests, men, women, children, SA men, all find themselves locked up for various reasons during the 1930s. So these pre-war uh, concentration camps are crucial to the establishment of uh, Hitler's dictatorship. And they also point forward to the better known and the much better memorialized, as, as Katya will discuss in the next talk, uh, concentration camps of the Second World War. Um, but for the remainder of this talk, I'd like to uh, think about this connection between pre-war and wartime uh, in terms of their personnel. Uh, so the pre-war camps and especially Dachau as being uh, schools of violence for, uh, for the SS. Um, <clears throat> So the time, the time Auschwitz opened in uh, 1940, Dachau had been schooling uh, SS men for uh, more than seven years. And it's very rare to find a, um, a senior figure in the wartime concentration camp system who didn't serve some kind of uh, apprenticeship in the so-called Dachau school. And this was the, kind of the SS's name for, for, for Dachau. And the most infamous is uh, uh, at the top here, uh, Rudolf Hess, who's the future Auschwitz commandant. And Hess came to Dachau as uh, just a rank and file sentry, just a, a guy in a tower in 1934. Um, and when he left for Sachsenhausen four years later, he's already a senior officer in uh, the system. And Hess is just one of thousands of, you know, of, of young males who are socialized uh, into violence in uh, Dachau. And this snapshot on the slide here um, is of the concentration camp system in late 1940, and it kind of captures the legacy of Dachau for the whole system. Uh, with a single exception, um, every concentration camp uh, commander uh, is a graduate of Dachau, and the exception is uh, Mauthausen, um, and even at Mauthausen, uh, the second in command uh, was a kind of a Dachau uh, uh, alumnus, if that's the that's the word. Um, the command staff of these camps too tended to be seasoned veterans uh, from the pre-war camp system, and SS concentration camp guards uh, also had they, they found their way into all kind of manner of wartime criminality. Um, oh, someone's taking control again. Oh, sorry about this. I'm, I'm going to take back control. It wasn't Sue, it wasn't me this time. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
OK, <clears throat> take three. Um, so uh, here in, in late 1940, uh, all of the people are Dachau graduates and the uh, people that have guards from Dachau are kind of like spread throughout um, um, Europe um, uh, as the terror kind of like emerges. So there's a, the, the concentration camp guards had their own Waffen SS uh, uh, battlefield division, the so-called uh, Death's Head Division, which left uh, uh, kind of a trail of racialized uh, carnage across France and um, the Soviet Union. Um, an example which will be familiar to my uh, UK audience, perhaps, is the infamous murder of 100 British soldiers of the Royal Norfolk Regiment at Le Paradis uh, during the Great Retreat to uh, Dunkirk in May 1940. So these British soldiers uh, surrendered to the Death's Head Division and were then promptly led to a, a nearby field and machine gunned in, uh, in cold blood. So as soon as these uh, these prison guards have, have prisoners in their hands again, they murder them, which says something about the, you know, the, the, the connection to the pre-war era. Um, so one of the big questions is why were SS camp guards so violent, both in the camps and also in their subsequent um, uh, uh, careers of violence in Nazi Germany? Um, and there's two general types of explanation for the behaviour of Nazi wrongdoers. Uh, there's what we might call the particularist uh, mode, and this invests uh, perpetrators with a kind of behavioural autonomy and claims that they acted because of their inner conviction. Um, and it argues essentially that uh, Nazi policemen, uh, Wehrmacht soldiers and camp guards acted as they did out of ideological enthusiasm. In other words, because they were Nazis. Uh, the second type of explanation is a more universalist mode, which kind of tends to, to bristle at this reasoning, which it sees as being rather circular. Um, and this type of explanation, uh, Christopher Browning made it quite famous in his book, Ordinary Men, uh, focuses instead on the psychology of authority, of compliance, of environment and group pressure. And in its most extreme form, this universalist mode implies that pretty much any of us would have done the same thing if we'd been in this same uh, situation, these same circumstances. Now, this is very, very uh, tricky terrain for uh, a historian writing about the concentration camps, uh, because she or he writes a kind of a moral and intellectual tightrope between, on the one hand, um, the, uh, the scylla of prioritising the everyday universal psychological aspects of Nazi violence and of Nazi perpetrators to the extent it almost can kind of see a bit, a bit too banal and ahistorical, uh, kind of an insult even to the particular miseries of the victims of um, these Nazi agents of violence. On the other hand, you've got the, uh, the, the Charybdis of prioritising the particularly Nazi aspects or components to the extent that they become kind of incomparable. They become inaccessible to the kinds of conceptual tools and explanations that historians freely apply to episodes of violence um, elsewhere. Uh, so here to use the evocative phrase of the great Israeli historian Yehuda Bauer, uh, Nazism in the camps would become a kind of quote upside down miracle, uh, end quote, inexplicable in historical terms, though perhaps you could you could explain it in theological terms uh, if you're a, um, a theologian. That's the real kind of the, that's the real nut of the issue in terms of kind of like why these agents of violence behave as they did. And it's polite perhaps to ask the inmates themselves of the camps, people on the receiving end, kind of what they thought was uh, going on. And this is the verdict of uh, Paul Martin Neurath, who was uh, an Austrian political prisoner who was Jewish, uh, who was imprisoned in Dachau in 1938 after the Anschluss. And Neurath wrote. Outsiders often ask me, how could they ever get 6,000 sadists together in one spot? They didn't get them, they made them. The conditions under which these SS men were trained made the system independent of the available supply of psychopaths, end quote. Neurath's very, very interesting, uh, very interesting read, his memoir um, is quite widely available. Now, there clearly were some psychopaths among the SS guard personnel, but most prisoner memoirs uh, um, most historians place them as a tiny minority of the overall uh, guard population, so no more than uh, five to ten percent. 
And this is consistent with academic research into uh, male military and paramilitary, sort of quasi-military institutions, which suggests that there's an incidence of genuine personality disorders, genuine clinical illness of no more than about 3%. And this is partly because individuals with clinical personality disorders, you know, genuine, uh, genuine psychopaths or sociopaths, really don't work in a, in a, in a, in a comradely environment, um, and especially somewhere as, as confined as a concentration camp. They don't develop the right kind of behaviours. They can't really be used. Um, uh, more eloquent than me, as ever, is uh, the Auschwitz survivor Primo Levi, um, and he puts it, quote, monsters exist, but they are too few in number to be truly dangerous. More dangerous are the common men, end quote. So instead, in the pre-war camps, extremely violent behaviours are variously schooled, encouraged and excavated from a large body of mostly very young males who often are recruited directly from the Hitler Youth at the age of 17 or 18. So at the time that Neurath um, was in uh, Dachau in 1938, the average age of the guards was just under 21. Um, so in the very brief time I have available to me, um, I'd just like to set up some of the kind of the dynamics of these young men um, and, and how this kind of like, I think, influences uh, the violent behaviours that they take with them into the wartime uh, setting. Um, gender norms, uh, I argue, have a tremendous mobilising power to sustain political programmes and ideologies which are wound around them. Um, this would be my kind of my, my, my proposition. I'm happy to talk about this more in the um, in the questions. So this burly gentleman on the slide is Theodor Eicher, and he is uh, Himmler's henchman uh, in control of the entire pre-war camp network. So Eicher's belligerent, leathery, uh, fanatical Nazi devoted to Himmler, and he's universally known to the camp guards as Papa Eicher, which I think is a good example of this sort of patriarchal gendered language uh, which uh, uh, operates throughout the, uh, the concentration camp SS guards. Um, another example of this is the is the slide I've put on the uh, uh, so the the motto I put on the slide here, um, which I think is a kind of a lodestar for uh, aspirational concentration camp manhood. So this is what I I wrote in the guard regulations for Lichtenburg in 1934. In service, there's only merciless severity. Outside service, there is heartwarming comradeship. Eicher's speeches are peppered with appeals to severity and especially to toughness, uh, the German term is Hertha. Um, and of course, neither toughness nor uh, this heartwarming comradeship are peculiarly Nazi masculine ideals. And in some ways, they remain part of the cultural expectations uh, you know, throughout the Western world um, for manly character. Um, so this takes us to the, the, this, this balance between the particular and the universal, um, which I want to kind of pick at. So let's start with the first of Eicher's exhortations to uh, to severity and to toughness. And the ideal here embraces um, implacability, uh, concealment of emotion and disregard for physical exertion and discomfort. Now, the key site for inculcating this toughness among guards was uh, here on the slide. I have uh, highlighted the uh, the SS area of Dachau. So there were different areas for the prisoners and for uh, and for the guards. Um, and here particularly the drill square of the SS compound. And so throughout the 1930s, um, SS recruits are uh, drilled, schooled and hazed here in the roughest Prussian German military tradition. Um, and by the late 1930s, centuries generally spent uh, one week each month as guards and three weeks doing drill and training. So this is a, you know, a very significant part of their, uh, their lived experience. It was expected that they would then cascade their wounded pride onto the luckless and defenceless prisoners. And so if you read through prisoner memoirs, uh, they all really dreaded the first day uh, uh, when uh, a company came from being drilled to actually look after the prisoner compound because there was so much resentment built up, so much kind of like uh, rage to unleash. Um, SS recruits who failed this kind of public test of manhood on the drill square are subjected to scorn and the usual kind of um, uh, misogynistic gendered 
uh, abuse of the parade ground. So they're uh, called girls, sissies, crybabies, mama's boys, this kind of thing. And shame is a key tool in fostering manhood. And I think that very young males who are often quite insecure in their masculinity and their gender identity um, are quite susceptible to these gendered forms of socialization. Uh, put in more homely terms, um, the societal notion that boys are turned into men by military service is used by the SS to draw them slowly into criminality in the camps. But of course, there's a big difference between being, you know, uh, uh, someone training for the Wehrmacht uh, north of Berlin and somebody posted in a concentration camp at Sachsenhausen. Uh, the SS's PR didn't like to admit this, but it's a very it's a different situation. And the big difference is that these young males suddenly have untrammeled power over inmates. Uh, male inmates are often quite a lot older than them. So the, the generational dynamics are quite kind of unsettling for uh, the prisoners. And here on the slide, this is the prisoner area. Uh, these, these are the barracks. Uh, <clears throat> this is 1945 after the camp's been rebuilt a few times. And when they're posted on duty in this area, um, the guards are urged to develop a kind of a complementary uh, form of toughness. Another of Iker's kind of pearls of wisdom, which is on the, um, the regulations for Dachau, is a tolerance means weakness. And to unpick this, uh, just as compliance and fortitude in uh, drill are coded masculine, so is aggression and pitilessness towards the Dachau inmates. And a guard that wasn't aggressive and, um, uh, and pitiless will be seen as unmasculine, probably as a girly, kind of like a girly swat. Um, now, the suppression of any vestigial compassion, of any vestigial irresolution, was very much a formal and explicit duty in the SS. So one of the criteria in SS annual uh, personal review forms, so yes, they have them here too, annual personal review forms, is um, toughness against oneself. Um, here to gegen sich selbst. And this means loosely, um, is the man in question alert to his potential for weakness and for irre irresolution? Is he able to suppress these unmasculine, undesirable qualities? Now, all this toughness against oneself was apparently very draining for SS camp personnel. As anyone who's spent, like me, years reading their indignant post-war testimony or Hussey's uh, kind of like published self-pitying memoirs, can confirm. And the reward for all this toughness was the second of the masculine ideals that Ica mentioned, um, and this is uh, our comradeship. So in the SS, comradeship is the kind of the code, magic code word, the buzzword for egalitarian, i.e. class-free, brotherly male togetherness. And in the documentary record of the SS, the terms friend and friendship almost always have a kind of a pejorative conspiratorial negative uh, connotation, whereas comrade and comradeship denote healthy egalitarian ties between men united by the world historical mission of the organization. So final slide, please to hear Catherine. Um, this, is, uh, so this is the heartwarming uh, comradeship. So these are guards at Dachau, and they enjoyed uh, uh, weekly comradeship evenings with plenty of free Bavarian beer. They play football several times a week and they get treated to complicated lectures about comradeship in their schooling seminar. And sometimes Himmler would turn up himself to deliver uh, a, great, uh, a great hymn to comradeship. When on duty, comradeship meant going the extra distance in ritualizing SS dominance over the prisoners, in sharing the burden for implementing orders in the camp, and in, um, uh, in uh, mutual exhortations to, 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 to toughness and to, to steely will. So the guard who wanted to belong joined in, uh, beating and laughing with the group. It's gone again. Um, I'm already run over, so probably I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll busk this from memory rather than putting it up again. Um, but uh, my, my basic point is that, uh, uh, Toughness and uh, comradeship are not particularly Nazi ideals, but they played a very central role in socialising very young men recruited directly from the Hitler youth into violence. Uh, and once these young men have been drawn in by the familiar imagery of uh, you know, the parade ground and of military service, uh, you have what is called in social psychology the paradox of sequential action in that 
the more that they kind of like uh, joined in the operational culture of uh, the institution, the harder it was for them to disengage. They could have left at any time, technically, because they were they were volunteers, but uh, but very few did. And attention to the pre-war concentration camps, I think, is important um, because it's a reminder of what happens quite easily when the rule of law is superseded by arbitrary violence and by paramilitaries who are assailing the institutions of the state. You can draw your own parallels. I won't do them for you. And I'll take any questions you like about the pre-war period uh, kind of in the in the Q&A. Uh, so thank you very much. Thanks, Chris, for that that really, really fascinating talk. Um, I'm already seeing some hands up, but I, I suggest what we do is take take questions at the end of, of um, Katja's presentation. So we'll we'll go straight on at this point to Katja, who's going to talk about German memory culture. Thank you very much. I will just try and get my uh, PowerPoint up as well in the hope that it doesn't get taken over. <laughs> um, is that on full screen now? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay. Um, yes. So thank you, Chris, for, for that. That was really um, fascinating. I mean, the, the problems um, that people had after the war with, with these German pre-war concentration camps or with the camps rather that originated in the pre-war period um, is a lot of the culture of, of what went on there that, that you've just heard um, described there. Uh, people were absolutely shocked when they liberated the, the camps, the uh, two camps that I'm going to use as examples, um, Dachau and Buchenwald, both of them were liberated by the uh, Americans. Um, and what they found was not only the uh, kind of condition that the camps were in, total chaos, um, dead bodies everywhere, um, an absolute mess, but also the stories that the prisoners told um, of the brutality of the guards and, and the randomness of the violence that uh, happened there. So there was an immediate problem in terms of what to do with these camps, um, in, in terms of the, the memory of them. Um, and what I want to investigate in the next 20 minutes or so um, is what both of the Germanys, East and West, um, effectively tried to do with the memory of these camps um, after the war, because um, that really differed quite extremely between East and West. Um, so I've chosen one Eastern and one uh, Western camp, uh, basically, as, as examples of that. Um, so uh, this, what, what both initially agree on, East and West, um, is the idea of, of never again. So the camps must serve a purpose and what happened there must serve a purpose in that um, the, the events mustn't be repeated. Um, and this is something East and West that you see straight away, regardless of who um, liberated the camps and regardless of where they, where they were, the prisoners that are in them in particular. Um, are absolutely adamant that their suffering um, must not have been in vain. And so therefore they this idea of, of never again really um, becomes a, a mantra almost for what should happen to the camps. Um, this is a picture of um, Dachau when that was uh, just liberated um, by the um, American army. And as I say, people were absolutely shocked at, at what they discovered. Um, it, just in terms of the sheer scale of it as well. Right? By that point, it was well known that concentration camps existed and that they existed on German um, soil as well. But but to actually see this um, firsthand, smell it as well, the stench was absolutely horrendous uh, from the bodies that were left behind um, and and kind of deal with the just the sheer scale of human suffering. Um, that, that was the initial impression that people had. And so the um, initial response to that, certainly from the American um, liberators in, in the camps that they um, they found uh, was that Germans must find out, must know about what had ha what had taken place here. So the logic was basically that that German civilians had helped uh, facilitate the violence that took place in these camps and the murders that took place in them, um, and they must therefore be shown um, what they'd basically helped to to bring about. Um, the image on the screen now is um, was taken on the 16th of April um, 1945. So the war hadn't even fi finished yet, um, but the Americans rounded up uh, around about 1,000 uh, people from Weimar, um, just down the road from Buchenwald concentration camp, um, and brought them up there to basically view um, the, the calamitous situation there. By that point, they'd piled up um, a lot of the bodies that they found um, in the camp. Um, and were sort of almost putting a little 
I'd say almost like a little path together through the concentration camp, uh, through the bodies deliberately so that the people would go and view them. As you can see on the picture, those that were actually in Germany at the time um, were largely those that weren't fighting on the front lines. So women, um, older people, children, um, and they were basically the, the types of civilians that were shown around um, the, the camps. What I always find interesting about these images is the, the range of responses uh, to what people are seeing. So when you look at, you know, the women there on the picture, that there's everything there from sort of disgust, just defiance, shock. Um, and that's exactly what you see in people's memoirs of the, of the time as well. Um, one that stuck with me was when um, quite a lot later, the Spiegel magazine interviewed some of the uh, people who were there and who were shown around the camps. Um, and one of the people that they asked was um, a, a woman called Edelgard Schlegelmilch, uh, who was then 17 years old. Um, and she described how uh, she was made to walk past the corpses and, and she said it was so awful, I, I just thought this can't be real, it must be a nightmare. And I closed my eyes and tried to imagine that they weren't real. But when she closed her eyes to try and step over a body that was right in front of her, uh, an American soldier drew his rifle and um, knocked her over the head with a rifle bat um, and basically said, you know, open your eyes, that's what you're here for, there, there's no way you know, that you can look away now, the, the war is finished. And that's effectively the, the logic behind this, that, that German civilians must be forced um, to look at the horrors that they'd helped um, facilitate. Uh, they were also shown the crematoria, um, where uh, they were, you know, meant to sort of see the, the industrial scale of the, um, of, the, of the deaths that occurred in these camps on German soil, um, which had, uh, a psychological impact of them on them, of course, but most people uh, actually withdrew even further when they saw this. And and like the um, you know schoolgirls account that I just read out, uh, most people seem to have just withdrawn in themselves and kind of gone down a route of no, this can't be real, um, you know, and, and kind of uh, gone into denial really about this. Um, the Americans themselves tried to um, phrase this as a huge success. Um, so this image here, for example. Uh, was published in, in a US Army magazine um, in 1945. And the caption read, even men in uniform went white uh, when they saw the piles of human ash and bones. Um, so this idea that you know they were really showing the Germans what they'd done um, was certainly uh, fed home in that, in that way. They also put up posters all around Germany where people didn't live near those um, pre-war camps. And concentration camps, um, which basically had sort of pictures of all of the atrocities, usually piled up bodies, and it would say underneath um, these atrocities, your fault. Um, and they were put up at bus shelters and, and uh, town halls and everywhere <coughs> around the um, sort of public facilities. Um, this didn't really have the desired effect as such on the wider population. At this point, they were very much in uh, of the mindset that they were the victims. Um, so you see this a lot, um, you know, as, as Christopher mentioned earlier as well, um, this kind of post-war self-pity is, is going on, not just amongst the guards, but amongst the wider German population as well, who feel very hard done by, by the conditions of the war, um, and also by the way that they'd lost the war and were now, now occupied. Who does take a huge interest, though, in what happens to the camps um, are the prisoners themselves. Um, and this is quite interesting. So the image there on the board, you know, as you can see, there is from the 19th of April. Um, so, you know, Hitler isn't even dead yet. The war hasn't finished yet. And, and the prisoners of Buchenwald, though, um, meet back together at this camp, which they had sort of liberated themselves in the last stages of the war. They, they'd managed to, to seize um, control of the camp. Um, and they returned there immediately um, to basically say that, uh, to pledge that they would do what they could to spread their story and share it and make sure that this uh, wouldn't be forgotten or um, kind of pushed to, to the side by the German population. The same happens at Dachau as well, um, where the prisoners meet on the 1st of May on Labor Day, given that so many of them were political prisoners, socialists and communists. Um, and they meet there on the 1st of May under the slogan, uh, never again fascism, never again war. Um, and again, swear the same allegiance basically to one another, uh, that they would form sort of like a like a bond almost to try and make sure that the concentration camps wouldn't just be uh, brushed under the carpet. At this point, you can see here they've even erected a sort of temporary memorial there in the background already at, at Buchenwald. Um, there's even a, a so-called Buchenwald 
oath uh, which the prisoners swore on that day um, and, and this is what they said that they would do. We will take up the fight until the last culprit stands before the judges of the people. Our watchword is the destruction of Nazism from its roots. Our goal is to build a new world of peace and freedom. This is our responsibility to our murdered friends and their relatives. So you can see the sheer determination that at the moment only comes from the prisoners themselves and their liberators, not from the wider German population in terms of actually confronting what, what happened at these camps um, and, and having some sort of vision as to what should happen with them next. Um, from 1949 onwards, this memory culture or this kind of idea um, in terms of, of how Germany should memorize its, its own pre-war camps uh, gets divided into East and West um, and, and gets very much exposed to the respective um, kind of cultural uh, spheres um, along that. So that's why I've chosen Dachau and, and Buchenwald to sort of give two examples, one East, one West. So Buchenwald, as I said earlier, just outside of Weimar, just on the on the southern fringes of uh, the Soviet zone. Um, and Dachau was just outside of Munich and in, in Bavaria, the American zone. Um, so I start with Dachau, um, which initially was uh, reused um, as a camp for German refugees. So east, out of Eastern Europe, around about 12 million people, German people were expelled um, after the war um, and they had to go somewhere. Um, and in the case of um, Dachau, it, it was one of the camps that was reused uh, to house the prisoners there. So they were using the very same barracks, although they were changed structurally a little bit from, from what they look like. Uh, previously, um, and uh, this is why the Bavarian authorities weren't overly keen to have any form of memorial there at this point. So what they didn't want alongside all of the social upheaval um, that came with the newly kind of arrived Germans from the East uh, is a constant reminder of the crimes that Germans had um, inflicted upon other Germans um, alongside other prisoners as well. Um, and so even the tiny little makeshift memorial that the prisoners had put there in 1945 in the crematorium uh, of Dachau uh, was supposed to be removed. And indeed, the entire crematorium um, was to be uh, demolished. Um, in 1955, the, the main Dachau councillor, um, Heinrich Juncker, put a petition in and that went through um, the Landtag, so the local parliament. Um, and so they were about to demolish the, the crematorium alongside the little memorial that was in it. Um, and this was only prevented because as part of the Paris treaties, um, there was a setup that the graves of the, of the victims of Nazism must be respected and, and were placed under special protection. And the crematoria counted as one of those graves due to the fact that people's ashes were um, buried there. Um, and so that's the only reason why that, that um, crematorium in, in Dachau survived the uh, sort of attempt to erase all memories of it in, in 1955. Um, this is an image um, still in, um, in the same sort of time frame. So you can see 1960. Um, from 1955 onwards, when it was clear that the crematorium couldn't be demolished, um, what, they, uh, what the prisoners wanted and pushed for um, through a newly kind of set up uh, committee was that there should be an official memorial site. That, that little makeshift memorial that they quickly set up in, in 1945 uh, should be replaced with an official um, memorial. The problem was that it was still only largely the prisoners that cared. So this is sort of 10 years on after the war um, and you have the prisoners themselves and their associates, but they did find a very powerful ally in the auxiliary Bishop of Munich, Johannes Neuhäusler, um, who was also keen to put some sort of memorial there. And he basically led a campaign um, towards um, a, a chapel being built there. And this is what you can see there on the screen is the uh, Mortal Agony uh, Chapel of, sorry, Mortal Agony of Christ Chapel, uh, which was put up there in the bottom corner of the screen. And, and the amount of people there that had gathered um, in the middle, you can see them all uh, lined up there. Uh, shows that actually it was becoming a, a kind of slightly more widespread thing now that some sort of memorial should be there and people were taking beginning to take an interest in this, but still largely the prisoners themselves um, in terms of who initiated it there. And then from 1960, when this was set up, they also set up the first museum at Dachau, um, which was actually kind of like a, the first educational attempt to do something with the memory of, of Dachau um, in the form of a museum. Um, Sorry to interrupt briefly, Catch your PowerPoint's disappeared, I think. Oh, okay. You're not seeing um, any slides. Let me see if reason. I can get it back up. 
it's probably somebody taking control of it again. <laughs> um, hang on, let's see if I can. Um, we can see the screen, like we can see the team. Oh, screen okay. At the so moment, if I but... go over to the other one, is it back up? Uh, yes. Yeah, yes. With the demolished uh, barracks on, hopefully. Yes. Yeah. That's brilliant. right. Yeah. So the the other big question was what should actually happen with the um, camp structures as such. So. You know the the guard towers the fences the barracks um should they be preserved and conserved or even perhaps rebuilt um or demolished eventually and the um kind of compromise solution was that the barracks all got demolished um because they'd been structurally changed quite a bit whilst they were housing the, the german refugees but in exchange the prisoners um achieved a, a solution whereby the guard towers um and the and the gatehouse and the fences were uh, preserved there so this was kind of what they were trying to do in, in terms of a, a compromise solution they also reconstructed two barracks um as a kind of museum piece almost um where they were basically reconstructing the original conditions um that were there during the time that it was used as a as a concentration camp but it is interesting that this kind of dilemma is still one that germany faces now as its um sites are becoming increasingly um affected by the weather and so on uh, whether you actually restore nazi sites um or destroy them in the end or, or replace them with with replicas um today so this was 20 years after and at this point um after after liberation at this point people are really beginning to take an interest and throughout the 1970s and 80s um visitors come for the first time visitors that are completely detached from the camp itself have not about the history and this really only I've lost sound. Is that generally, or could it just be me on my PC, please? Uh, am I there again? Are you on yes, now? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. again, okay. somebody must have Thank unmuted you. me there. I just heard it. Heard it go. Yeah. yeah so Dachau is now one of the most visited sites, and for 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 the first time, really, in in its history, people go there because they want to find out and learn about it, and it's really become a sort of education um, center now with a museum and, and educational facilities. But it's it's important to to bear in mind that this took decades to to be set up. Germans really did not want to be reminded of what had taken place there. Um, in West Germany. So by contrast, East Germany has got a completely different rationale when it comes to, to the concentration camps on its ground. Uh, Buchenwald being, being the main one. Um, there are others like Sachsenhausen, for example, as well outside of Berlin. Um, but Buchenwald really turns into like a, a national site of, of commemorate, commemor commemorating, but in a very particular East German way, as, as we'll see in a minute. Um, so this picture here is, is taken in 1950. Um, in the meantime, between the end of the war and, and uh, 1950, the camp was used as a, as a special camp, um, which is kind of quite euphemistic for what happened there. So this is basically the Soviets reusing this camp um, as a facility to keep mostly former Nazis, but also a lot of people that were just um, getting in their way politically, including um, social democrats and other people who were trying to work with them but didn't quite fit in ideologically and the special camp uh, wasn't of course a concentration camp in the actual uh, sense that the Nazis used it um, but the conditions in this prison were still so um, atrocious that 7,000 uh, people died between in the in the winter of 1946 to 47 which was the worst um, of 28,000 um, inmates that were in there um, due to hunger, starvation, lack of sanitation, and uh, yeah, just the, the unsanitary conditions in there. Um, when, West, uh, when East Germany was founded in 1949, um, the Soviets were keen to make sure that it wasn't founded with a great big open prison slash concentration camp in the middle of it. 
And so they basically dissolved this and handed it over to the authorities um, in East Germany to do something with. And even the Soviets already recommended uh, that it should be uh, used as a um, as a national memorial site. So what they did is the the idea was that this camp Buchenwald was supposed to turn into a, a kind of shrine to the the struggle and the um, endurance of German communists and socialists in the face of um, sort of adversity, if you will. So because there were so many of the communists um, uh, incarcerated at Buchenwald during the Nazi years, and because the camp had in the end liberated itself, those two things worked together to really create the sort of foundation myth of East Germany as the pinnacle of that struggle. So the idea that they kind of got through the dark years because of their strength of character um, and because of the in inevitability really of the socialist revolution, this is what that camp was supposed to become a shrine for. So the focus is not at all on the victims as such as victims, um, but the focus is on how they got through these uh, dark years by the sheer power of their, of their will um, and endured this so that a better future could prevail. And that's entirely how this, how this camp is set up. So to that purpose, they didn't need the barracks um, at all. And so they just erased them. Um, and, and the piles of rubble that you can see there is basically all of the piles um, of um, uh, like the bricks basically that the barracks were made out of um, and uh, they demolished them completely. Uh, left the guardhouse um, and, and the gate, um, famous gate with the inscription Yidem das Seine, which means something like um, each to their own or, or sort of everyone gets what they deserve is one of those cynical Nazi slogans. Uh, that was all left there, um, but the entire site was completely redesigned as like an educational experience, almost the exact opposite of what happened um, at Dachau. So what they did is they created this immensely oversized uh, kind of memorial site that you can see there on the screen now, hopefully, um, whereby most of the original structures have gone. Um, Another interesting aspect was that there was a Bismarck um, like tower, so one of the one of the original um, Bismarck memorials on a on a hill nearby overlooking the site that also had to be destroyed, even though it had nothing to do with Nazism. It was just in the way of destroying this kind of educational experience that they were trying to set up. And the idea was basically that you would now walk in through the through the gate um, down the slope um, towards um, the, the mass graves. And this was supposed to be like a descent into the night of fascism, as they phrased it. So the idea that you're walking down into darkness and then you're surrounded by the mass graves of those who died there, especially the, the communist ones were, of course, highlighted um, in this. Um, and then you walked along on the right side of the screen, um, what they called the uh, Avenue of the Nations. So if I zoom in a bit, it looked like this. Um, which was supposed to then be uplifting after you just seen the mass graves, um, a, a statement about solidarity between the different nations that were all affected, like a statement to internationalism, effectively. So you walked along that on the right, um, which would then show you what these people had died for, basically, whose graves you've just seen, um, so that you're walking towards progress. And then you walked up the stairs, which you can see in the front of the screen, back up the hill, um, those were the um, stairs to freedom um, or a stairway to freedom. And then at the top would be the Tower of Freedom. And in that tower was an exhibition about the struggle of the prisoners against their oppressors, the self-liberation of, of Buchenwald and this entire sort of myth making about how Buchenwald effectively so served as a, a kind of cradle of um, the, the victory of socialism over the darkness of of fascism. So it's, it's an entirely sort of artificial construct, this entire site. Uh, a lot of it was reforested as well, um, so you can't even underneath the forest now kind of see the original structures of it, um, because it didn't matter. That wasn't really the point to preserve what was there, but the point was to create an entirely new kind of shrine to, to, to socialism um, in this. Um, so this is here the Tower of, of Freedom at the top. Um, and you can just see the sheer scale of it, as well as the typical sort of monumental um, style that the socialists used to, um, to, to hammer their ideas home. Um, interestingly, though, despite all of this focus on the political prisoners at Buchenwald, um, there was a backlash against that from, from the German um, kind of middle classes and the intelligentsia and lots of uh, faith groups and other, other kind of activists. Uh, who wanted to make sure that the other victims of Buchenwald were also commemorated. 
Um, so that includes all the other groups, um, Jews, Roma and Sinti, homosexuals and so on. Um, they, they were all um, now kind of getting the, the attention that the, that the regime didn't want to give them necessarily. Um, and uh, in the 1970s and 80s, uh, the, the memorial site was actually reconst reconstructed, got a new exhibition in there. Um, and various different faith groups were also using the site um, for memorial walks and so on, as you can see here with the, with the Christian groups doing the, the so-called crosswalks um, into Buchenwald. So the, even the GDR regime eventually uh, opened itself up a little bit towards the idea that it wasn't just communists and socialists who um, suffered in this camp. Uh, one macabre aspect of the way that the GDR remembered um, the, the sort of pre-war camps uh, was uh, the way in which they wanted to show how um, perverted and devious fascism is as an ideology. So the idea was basically that if you show fascism and, and Nazism in particular in its most atrocious form, then people will understand um, that it's it's something to be avoided at all costs. So this idea that capitalism leads to fascism, leads to imperialism, and then to fascism. Um, kind of the idea is people walk into this camp, look at it and go, OK, next time I think that capitalism is a good idea. Um, I think of the horrors that I've seen at, at Buchenwald and this is where it will end. And so th whilst this picture here is, is was taken shortly after liberation with some of the items um, that people found at Buchenwald, um, they weren't all on display, but the lampshade on the right was um, throughout the, the uh, history of the GDR on display in the exhibition with a little sign in front of it that said um, a lampshade made of uh, human skin. Whether that's true or not, there's still a debate even on the on the website of the Buchenwald Memorial um, uh, sort of site. You can see a whole site dedicated to it under frequently asked questions. There were several prisoners who said that they'd heard that Ilse Koch, the, the wife of the commandant who we heard about earlier, um, was supposed to have commissioned this lampshade to be made from the skin of, of prisoners. Um, but the GDR authorities, once again, didn't really care whether this had actually happened or not, never tested the material um, and just put the, the lampshade basically out there. And it was still there in the 1980s uh, with its little label in front of it, precisely because it wanted to draw people in and people were supposed to sort of stand there, be appalled by this um, devious ideology and, and be sort of, you know, put off its, its lesser forms, including capitalism. Um, as a result, whilst uh, in West Germany, the trend went exactly the opposite um, and all of the atrocities were not graphically depicted, um, but the, the sites were actually quite sort of sanitized and very devoid of information. They were, they were kind of just left as they were for people to go into. This lampshade in particular was immediately removed when the um, when the Berlin Wall fell um, and the entire site at Buchenwald was uh, redesigned to, to fit into a more sort of Western model of, of commemoration. So post 1990, you then see emerging of these um, uh, sort of two ways of, of um, commemoration of the pre-war camps. Germany, in my opinion, still hasn't quite um, found an ideal form in which it's happy with basically in terms of using the sites that it's got on its own soil um, to try and, and commemorate Nazism. There still is a, is a balance to be struck there between informing visitors of what actually took place there and um, telling them what they, what they ought to make of this. And this latter aspect is still very much in the foreground. But it is slowly changing and more information is being uh, provided now in these camps and, and they're becoming uh, increasingly more confident that visitors can kind of um, see for themselves using the facts just how horrendous this this was. Um, but all of the camps, particularly the East German ones, are still very much shaped by um, the ideology because you can't undo basically what, what the East German regime uh, had done in terms of rebuilding the, the, the camps themselves. Okay. Thank you very much.